And without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand over to our first presenter, Luke Winchester, who's joining us from Sydney. And I'll say a quick thanks while Luke is getting set up for presenting uh, late in the evening his time, 9.30 in the evening Sydney time. So thanks, Luke. No worries, Mark. Yeah. And uh, just to clarify, from Newcastle, not Sydney, I uh, right. better make sure I get that one right. Um, yeah, thanks for, for having me on. So the, the, the stock I've chosen to, to talk about today is, is Laser Bond Limited, an ASX microcap, one I've known for quite a while. Um, and I think it's, a, it's an interesting stock and it's an example of, um, you know, some, some genuine Aussie innovation. So uh, just a, a quick who are we, so, so Oracle Investment, yeah, we're based a couple of hours out of Sydney for those who don't know the geography of Australia. Um, and we run a few active portfolios and we run it through the, the separately managed account structure, which um, from what I gather is a bit more common overseas. It's actually only sort of um, quite new to Australia and, and most funds run in the, um, the managed fund unit trust structure. So it's a little bit of a point of difference for us. Um, and we've been running now for a about five or six years, I think 2015 was um, when we sort of got started. Um, just a quick disclaimer there, but I'll, um, I'll jump straight into it. So um, Laser Bond Limited, it's about a 67 mil market cap um, around the, 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 the close of today. In a nutshell, it's a provider of surface engineering technology. So um, I'll, I'll get a bit more detail in a second about what that is, but it's putting a coating onto the surface of a piece of heavy machinery and it extends the wear life of that machinery. Um, their technologies can add anywhere up to 10 times wear life. Um, and it allows the customer to then reduce downtime, inventory and maintenance costs. Um, it's a classic founder led business founded in 1992 by two brothers. Um, one of those brothers still continues on today. The other one sort of stepped back now into a consulting role and the family um, altogether owns about 45% of the business. Uh, and, and like a lot of other classic micros, it's a situation where a core business is steady, profitable, and, and has a bit of growth. But there's some real blue sky in, in, in a couple of other segments that, that really gets you excited. Um, it's been a pretty good performer the last few years. Um, management have got some ambitious targets out in the market. Um, and the share price chart down the bottom sort of tells a bit of an interesting story about the business. I'll maybe touch on this a bit later, but you can certainly see from sort of 2016 through to sort of mid 2018, the business was going through a real turnaround, um, sort of coming out of, out of the mining boom we had in Australia. Um, a business like Laserbond profited very heavily from that, sort of had to find its footing post that mining bust. Um, and uh, the business has, has really started to turn around since then. And hopefully is ready for that next leg up. So a bit more about what exactly they do. So their core technology is, is laser bond, is, is, is the, 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 the um, technology they, they've labeled it. It's a laser cladding process. It, it uses a laser to heat the surface of a piece of machinery and then a metallic powder is then injected and, and bonded to the surface of that machinery to create a, a micro layer on top. So you can see the diagram there to the right, it's a nice simple um, sort of demonstration as to what they do. Um, there's a lot of internally generated IP around this business though. Um, they've got some patents out. You can, you can log on to, to IP Australia and, and have a read of them. And the patents are, are focused very heavily on the, the laser, um, the position, the speed of the laser. And the main reason for that is the, um, the main material they use in that metallic powder is tungsten, which um, it doesn't actually work too well with extreme heat. So, um, you know, um, some other businesses have given this laser cladding a go. And it, it looks a little bit like that image on the left down the bottom where there's um, patchiness to it. The laser bond process is able to do it at, at, at slightly lower um, temperatures and allows for a better dispersion of those particles and doesn't create those weak points in the coating. So it allows for a better product. Um, so that's the that's the technology, the core technology they have behind them. Um, it is it is quite novel. Um, these guys they they can sort of speak pretty certainly about um, their position within Australia, um, and they think they're head and shoulders above any competition in Australia. It's a bit more difficult to say, you know, whether there's small businesses like themselves around the world that have sort of got the uh, you know a technology on par with what they have but they think they're also world leading as well um, so it's a, um, 
a very interesting um, story from that point of view. Some, like I said, some genuine um, Aussie innovation. Um, so I grabbed this slide from their presentations. And I think it's a good sort of introduction to the business. So there's three main operating segments. They all feed together and, and then they um, include R&D there as well, which, which drives the whole business. But the core business I referred to earlier, which is sort of the engine and the steady driver of earnings is, is what they, they label services. And this is where um, uh, customers will, will freight them um, heavy machinery for repair and refurbish. So they've got, um, well, they, they now have three factories in Australia, but, but primarily uh, two, the, the third one's only just been recently purchased as part of an acquisition. Um, so a customer will freight a part to them, to, to one of their factories. Um, they will perform the laser bond process on that, generally takes between uh, sort of a couple of weeks um, and it's then freighted back to the customer. Um, so by doing this, as they sort of have at the top of that diagram there, they then get exposed to all the, the, the problems that these customers have, the pieces of the machinery that's constantly wearing down, where's the, uh, the weak points in their manufacturing or their construction process or, or, or their business, what causes them the most headaches. And so they're able then to feed that into um, other areas of their business. And, and the next one uh, that, that sort of is a natural evolution from that is the products division um, is the term they use. And it's the exact same laser bond process. There's nothing new about the products division in that sense, um, but rather than using it on uh, parts that are being repaired or refurbished, they're doing it for new parts. So they're, they're um, doing it on a new part. They're then selling it to an OEM partner who distributes it, or they're looking to um, sell it directly themselves, branded as a laser bond part. So I'll, I'll touch on that a bit later. Um, the third main operating segment, and certainly the blue sky for this business, is a, is a nascent technology division. So this is very new, um, and it's simply looking to license this technology overseas. Um, they're looking to partner with... Um, with uh, some, some, some global partners that can bring them some, some scale and, and, and bring the brand out to the world. So if they're able to do that, obviously it'd be very exciting, a very capital light way to, to, to sort of grow this business and um, expand overseas with much less risk than um, physically going and buying or expanding into new factories, which is what they'd have to do through a, um, a services division expansion. Um, so just touching on that services division a bit more, um, it is that core engine of the business. Uh, it's historically grown very strongly, top and bottom lines. So margins peaked at about 27% pre-COVID. Um, I've used 2019 simply because calendar year 20 does include some government assistance. So it's worth noting that for um, all of the slides coming up that the, the Australian government provided some, some pretty good um, assistance to, to not just small businesses, but all businesses in Australia. Uh, like I said before, two long-term factories. They've recently acquired a third, so that was uh, sort of mid last year, and that will give a bit of uh, support for revenue growth in the short term. Um, management are pretty clear that they're exploring further acquisitions to expand that geographical footprint. That's just within Australia, so international expansion will be focused on the other two divisions. Um, one of the reasons why acquisition works well for these guys is there are other types of surface engineering, not just obviously the laser bond process, um, generally more simpler uh, types of surface engineering. Um, and so what they've found is they're able to identify some of these businesses in, in different geographies, different customer bases, um, and look to uh, implement the laser bond system into those businesses. And so, you know, um, COVID was unfortunate for them, um, no doubt about that with the services. You can see the hit they took there in calendar year 20. But one, one silver lining to COVID was because of the, the um, associated COVID shutdown, they were able to implement the, um, the laser bond system in this new acquisition quicker than what they expected. So um, that's, that's part of the blueprint moving forward. Um, they've sort of got their eyes on a couple of targets, um, obviously, you know, figuring out prices and things like that. Um, but if they can find the right targets and look to grow um, through that acquisition and then grow organically within those acquisitions by rolling out the laser bond system, uh, could really do some, um, some good things for this services division. Um, interestingly enough, speaking to the business, um, they, they, they do look to target customer bases and things like that. But one of the other things they find is they struggle to find skilled labor. 
Um, so part of acquisitions is um, if they can find um, competitors who, who have that skilled labour, it's a big consideration for them. Uh, so like I mentioned before, COVID impacted 2020, but the leading indicators uh, are looking good. So management said they've got a, a record um, order book that's been quoted out to customers. And in general, strong commodity prices that we're seeing right now are generally supportive for, for their um, customers' CapEx decisions. Um, you know, when times are good, their customers are, are sort of bringing those um, CapEx decisions forward rather than delaying them. Um, and when I first came across this business and, and sort of spoke with management and, and said, you know, where are you seeing your growth come from? Um, they sort of said to me that most of it's come just through product acceptance over time. So um, before the laser bond solution, um, you know, laser cladding was seen as, um, you know, a, a hit or miss solution. You, you, um, that, that slide I had up originally sort of showed that. Um, and so it took a while for customers to really accept the product. And so they've found that, that most of their growth has come from, um, you know, having a, doing a small amount of work for a customer. And then over time, that customer getting more and more faith in the system um, and providing more and more work to, um, to laser bond as time goes on. And I'll come back to their customers in a second. It's a big part of the investment thesis, just how big and blue chip their customer base is. Um, uh, but yeah, so services division um, growing, not not hyper growth, but it's 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 good solid growth, um, very profitable, and it's certainly the um, the earnings engine of the business moving forward. Um, so products um, sort of then comes in over the top and, and and will be a good driver of growth for the business, but but you know profitable in its own right too. Uh, as I said before, it is an extension of that services division. It's using that same laser bond process. It's just doing it earlier in the, in the life cycle of a piece of machinery. Um, so it's not as mature as, as services and it's worth keeping that in mind. It's still dominated by a couple of large OEM customers um, and a um, very small laser bond branded product range. Um, nonetheless, growth trend has been strong and, 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 and growing and management believe that it will accelerate as they bring more products to market. So um, the, other, the other part of it is that, that mark, uh, margins are fluctuating given the immaturity of that segment, but I believe they'll average out higher than services over time. And I think calendar year 2019 and, and also um, calendar year 20, even removing the government assistance sort of shows that the, the margin potential is higher than services. Um, so again, chatting to management here, they're particularly focused on their laser bond branded solutions and the two that they have um, the most commercial viability for in the short term, uh, steel mill rolls and um, rotary feeded for feeders for bark blowers. So um, these are, are, are two solutions where, um, you know, the products are developed from the, um, the knowledge gained through the services division. So, you know, they, they see the problems these customers are having, they realise they can provide the solution and they look to do it earlier in the product's life cycle rather than waiting for customers to come to them for a refurb or repair. And then the tech division. So this is the newest division, but it's potentially the most promising. It's certainly the blue sky to the, um, to the laser bond investment thesis. So it's looking to license the laser bond technology and, and, and you know, be monetized in three ways. The first is selling a laser bond system. Um, so that's either off the shelf or, or custom built to a customer's needs. Um, so management think that an off the shelf system is somewhere between sort of one to two mil. And then obviously the customized system could be sort of two to three. Um, ongoing license fees are then attached to that um, and it is tied to the usage of the system so again management estimated about 500,000 per annum um, if, a, if a system runs at high usage and then the ongoing sale of that metallic powder consumable that's about a million dollars a year at high usage. Now management are quite ambitious with their targets and that's where the ambitious, ambitiousness of their um, FY22 target comes from. So they're targeting two technology sales a year moving forward, which if they can achieve that, it's substantial revenue growth because you can see through those numbers, you're talking about four to five mil revenue from a system coming on at, at high usage. Now, the most obvious target customer they have is their existing large OEM customers who distribute globally. So that sale in 2019 was to a UK OEM. Um, so they had a relationship with their Australian arm. 
in um, you know conversing with the, the the head office in the UK, um, I believe that that customer trialed a number of different systems globally and, and chose to go with Laserborn, but they already had that relationship through the Australian arms. So you know it's 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 a good sort of indicator as to what this segment can do um, because of that blue chip client base, which I'll, I'll get to in a second. Um, management also disclosed they've agreed to preliminary terms with the US OEM. Um, and, a, and an agreement is subject to some final testing. So again, it's that same playbook of a, um, you know, I, I don't know this for sure, but my assumption is that they've got a relationship with that OEM and you're now just, um, you know, finalising a way for them to, um, to take the laser bond system international. Um, just for what it's worth on the, the chart on the right, you can see a sale there as well in calendar year 2017. That was actually their first sale. It was to a Chinese customer. Um, and that was subsequently um, uh, cancelled shortly after. So that's why there was no ongoing um, revenue there. And then in calendar year 20, you can see about $200,000 in revenue. It's a bit below the, um, the, 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 the license fees and consumables you'd normally expect. And uh, management sort of disclosed that was due to COVID slowing the, um, the ramp up from that UK customer, um, you know, the, the planned ramp up they were supposed to have. Um, I touched before, you know, they're constantly investing in R&D um, to improve their offering um, and they're quite good at actually, um, they, they stay very quiet until, you know, the R&D um, has, a, has a commercial product. So they, re they recently announced uh, that they've developed a product known as eClad. It's an alternative to chrome plating, uh, primarily used in hydraulic cylinders and it actually uses a carcinogenic in um, its manufacturing process. So Regulators have been um, demanding alternatives to, to chrome plating for years. However, you know, in the past, it was the, the, the cost of those alternatives just made it impossible. Um, E-clad is cheaper, longer lasting, quicker to implement. Um, but speaking to management, it's, it's, it's a no brainer solution. Um, they're looking to bring it to market through their technology division and license it to existing chrome plating customers. Um, they're already speaking to customers in Europe uh, simply because the EU is moving faster on, um, on regulation. So it's the most likely market in the near term. Um, I've touched a few times on this global customer base, but it's a big, it's a big part of the, um, the thesis because it really gives them that foothold for um, international expansion that they're looking to chase at the minute. So, uh, you know, we've got the, the global audience here today. I'm sure there's many names there that, that um, people recognise, big multinational businesses. Um, right now, Laserbond's relationships with them are probably just to their Australian arms. Um, or, you know, you've, you've just started to, to maybe sell to a, a company like Nucor in the US, um, but it's being able to expand through these businesses and into their international operations um, through the foothold they've got, I think, is, is what makes that is um, it's, it's a classic um, micro cap where the, the thesis not only changes, or I shouldn't say change, but evolves with the business. Um, but when I first looked at this business, I, I went down to the, I think it was their 2017 AGM and I was the, the first person who wasn't a employee of the business or a member of the family to attend the AGM uh, in some time. So it's just, it's, it's, it's a good example of how in micro caps, um, you know, individual investors or, or small investors can really gain an edge. Um, that turnaround has probably played out. And, and, and as I've touched on so far today, the investment thesis now hinges very heavily on management executing that international growth, but they have the proven IP and the technology. So um, not only that, if they're successful in doing it, I think their return on capital and, and um, their margins will substantially improve um, just as that technology division and products as well uh, become a bigger part of the business. Um, and in a nutshell, look, it ticks all the boxes we look for at Oracle, you know, high insider ownership, demonstrated track record of growth, genuine IP, strong balance sheet and, and good returns on capital. Um, a, a brief look at the financials the, here. Um, you can see some lumpiness between the segments, which is sort of masking that top line. Um, oh. <laughs> you lost me there, sorry, um, which is just uh, masking the top line. 
Um, you can see the recovery in the margins also. That's a big part of the thesis as well. Um, but I'm expecting now that top line to, to really accelerate if they can uh, execute that international expansion. So looking forward, I sort of touched on this, management have a pretty ambitious target of 40 mil revenue in FY22. So for me, I think that requires two technology licenses and, and, and probably contributions from some um, products that are in development. Um, if they can do that and, and can sort of maintain their, their pre-COVID net margins, um, the, the valuation of the business very quickly looks um, looks looks uh, very interesting, about 13 times earnings. Um, a couple of brokers have come to the story recently as the business has sort of gained more attention. Um, they're forecasting a little lighter than that, than that target, um, but nonetheless, there could be upside there if management are able to do it. And a big part for me is that I think the, um, the, the unit economics and, and, and margins and returns on capital of this business will substantially improve as, um, as that uh, segment mix changes moving forward. Um, some key risks, they do have some customer concentration. It's worth noting that a couple of customers um, uh, are their largest. That has been coming down over time and, and should continue to. You've obviously got the key personnel risk. You've got a couple of brothers who founded this business and they're still involved. Um, they did appoint a German um, surface engineering specialist um, a few years ago to, to mitigate some of that. Um, cyclical industries, um, no doubt about that. Competition's always a big one. Like I said before, management think their product is industry leading, not just in Australia, but globally, but it's a big market and, and no doubt peers are incentivized to continually innovate and try to compete. And then you've just got the execution of international growth. Um, they've got a well-regarded product here in Australia. They're, they're, they're well-known and a strong brand, but it's always inherently risky trying to move into new markets, even with those the, the foothold from those customers. Um, but in a conclusion, look, I think they're potentially on the cusp of taking this well-established domestic product global. Um, they've got the blue chip customers to do that and the business model, if they can execute that technology model, allows them to do it in a pretty capital light manner. Um, you know, on pre-COVID earnings, the value is about 24 times, which isn't, isn't cheap. Um, and no doubt there's some growth priced into that there. Um, but you should get um, steady growth from that core services business, um, either organically or through acquisitions. But then if management are able to execute even some of the potential of products and technology, there's substantial upside for these earnings to come off a, a very low base. Um, so I'll wrap it up there. And Mark, if you've got any questions. I haven't seen any coming through yet. I think everybody's a little bit gun shy, but let me start with one. Maybe we get the, we get the ball rolling here. Um, if we just go back to the core business, Luca, you kind of touched on it, I think, in your second last slide. Um, you know, is that core business, you know, what kind of growth rate are you kind of factoring in and that? Is it a GDP growth rate style business or, or is it, you know, can it, can it grow higher than that? Um, then, uh, you know, without acquisition, like how, how dominant are they in the Australian market or do they need acquisitions to actually grow the services business? Yeah, no, look, when I, when I say steady, um, you know, steady um, doesn't necessarily mean um, GDP growth. I mean, um, even put acquisitions to the side, the, the, that core services business should give you 10, 15% growth. Um, even their existing factories in, in, in Sydney and, and, and Adelaide here in Australia, um, uh, from memory, neither of them are close to capacity. Um, and acquisitions have obviously just come on top of that. But part of that as well, like I alluded to, is the, the growth through acquisition won't just be plugging revenue into a business. It's the ability to, to make an acquisition of a um, customer base or, or skilled employees and then grow organically within that acquisition as well. So a couple of parts to that. But, but yeah, no doubt, even, even um, putting, putting acquisition to the side, it's probably still a 10 to 15% core business um, growth there. Okay, and then we get another, or they're, now they're coming in. Um, uh, funding, are they, you know, adequately capitalised to, you know, do all of this growth, I guess, you know, on the, on the products business, on the consumables, if they get, you know, a big ramp up in the technology sales, um, you know, are they, I guess, have they got the balance sheet to, to match their growth plans? Yeah, no, it's a, it's 
very good question. Um, it, it's, it's a very strong balance sheet. Um, there's a little bit of corporate debt. Um, they generally lease most of their equipment. So the, the, the new accounting standards makes the debt look a little bit worse than what it is. Um, generally, the business has been self-funded through its own cash flows. Um, and I think part of that is, is you know, you've got that founder-led management there who, who you know, haven't wanted to dilute themselves. Um, look, if, quite honestly, I think if they had some, you know, big opportunities that, that needed, you know, maybe a, a couple of tech sales that were very close to closing or, or something like that, they may raise a bit of capital from the market. But um, for me, I haven't factored anything like that in. I, I think they're going to be able to continue to do what they do. Um, the nature of the tech is, you know, will allow them to, to do it pretty capital light. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not factoring in any, any equity raises. If they did, I think it would only be if there was, you know, some, some big growth opportunities to capture very quickly. Yeah. And then just maybe another one on the, on the risks. Um, critical inputs, I think the question might be around, you know, into the consumables themselves in terms of like, you know, the basic raw materials, you know, just with commodity prices and rare earth prices. Um, is that a major risk for them or not really? Um, that's a good question. To be honest, I've, I've, I've never actually asked that question of management before and I've, and I've never seen them sort of mention input costs as a, as a major risk. Look, they do use, you know, obviously metallic, metallic powders as, you know, that's, that's the, the key bonding agent. Um, so so there, there would be some sort of sensitivity to, to, to metal prices. Um, look, I, I may even take that one on notice, to be honest, um, and, 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 and reach out to management. But, but like I said, I've never seen them um, reference that as, as, as a key risk. So um, I'd, I'd probably hesitate to say it's not a, a major factor for the business. Yeah, if, if management are not calling it out, then it's, it's probably not high up on their um, priority list. Luke, we're, we're just coming up on time and I know our second presenter is waiting in the wings. So we thank you very much for your presentation. And if you could just stop sharing your screen and we'll yeah. head over here to South Africa 